infrequent bathing, lack of hand washing, shared personal items and poor oral hygiene. You won't believe how filthy colonial America was. Personal hygiene and grooming have undoubtedly evolved and regressed over time. No two doctors in colonial America could agree on the advantages of bathing for health, let alone how to treat patients when they became ill. Even though trash was frequently dumped into the streets, colonial people hardly ever remembered to wash their hands with soap and water afterward. How did kings, queens and peasants take care of themselves in colonial America? Well, close your nose because it's about to go down. Welcome back to History Rediscovered, subscribe and hit the like button to support. The sad filthy truth about hygiene in colonial America. A wet cloth and a pail of water were used to bathe. In the 17th and 18th centuries, full-body baths were rare, and they were typically only given to infants, whose purpose was more to harden them than to strictly clean them. Each morning, men, women, and children washed their hands and cheeks, but bathing wasn't really done properly. People would clean themselves off wherever they could find seclusion using a basin, cloth, and possibly a sponge. Baths might have been fairly prevalent, but soap was not. Swimming was a different method, but dips in a nearby lake or stream were more for recreation than for getting clean. Only the wealthy could afford bathtubs, which were frequently only big enough for sponge baths. Women's body odor was once believed to be a defense mechanism. Although opinions on bathing varied during America's colonial era, some of the country's founding fathers were unambiguous about how they felt about women's hygiene. For instance, Thomas Jefferson once told his daughter Martha, that a lack of cleanliness and delicacy in your intercourse was the most repulsive thing to him and other men. In the latter half of the 18th century, physicians recommended women to take baths, largely to treat diseases of the female reproductive system. Cleanliness was of a higher order, even though Virginia Dr. Thomas Ewell admitted the conventional wisdom that women were so constituted as to become offensive to the nose for the purpose of suppressing too ardent devotion of males. The stench was repulsive to all women, despite the fact that some women use scent as a means defense to ensure protection by rendering themselves as disgusting as possible. You were clean just by changing your underwear. Wearing clean undergarments is one notion about personal hygiene that appears to have persisted since colonial times. However, individuals of this era believed that being clean included donning clean underwear. Known for adhering to this philosophy, Alexander Hamilton was observed changing into fresh underwear several times per day in hot conditions. According to historians at Colonial Williamsburg, people in the past thought undershirts, shifts, and other undergarments could absorb all perspiration and grime from one's epidermis. The wealthy had plenty of clean underwear set out for them every day. Wealthy members of society, according to W. Peter Ward in The Clean Body, A Modern History, were more concerned with maintaining a clean look. To society, wearing clean, crisp white bedding was sufficient proof of hygiene. Protestantism linked sin and untidiness. On the subject of personal hygiene, medical professionals were divided. Some thought that body oils and the like were crucial for maintaining health. Others thought that maintaining cleanliness was crucial to warding off disease and illness. In colonial America, religious doctrine had a strong influence on bathing customs and notions of cleanliness, which only served to exacerbate these sentiments. Puritans made linkages between filth and the devil and sin that also had societal repercussions. People who bathed were less likely to engage in sin, commit wrongdoings, and be impoverished. Cleanliness was directly related to morality. With filthiness of person in gender, in filthiness of mind, water was purifying from head to toe. Spiritual health was aided by clean bodies, clean garments, clean homes, and clean communities. However, Puritans had a hard time accepting the notion that bathing had a bad impact on virtue. Particularly, it was believed that public baths contributed to illness and immoral sexual behavior. Lice had a solution, and a cause, in powdered wigs. The middle and upper castes in colonial America donned powdered wigs. Both men and women wore hairstyles made of both human and animal hair, frequently cutting their own hair very short in the process. Shaving one's scalp also served to keep lice from infesting hair at a time when lice were widespread. However, wigs themselves were prone to bugs, so people either sent them out for regular treatment or had slaves and attendants dress 
them to keep them clean and presentable. Wigs should be cleaned and maintained weekly, but because it was an expensive procedure, some people went weeks or months without receiving a thorough cleaning. Lice could be removed from wigs by boiling them, and they were frequently scented to deter insects. Sassafras, bay leaves, and citrus were a few of the typical aromas. Powders and oils could also mask a person's odor as well as the scent of their own hair, but pomades, which are used to style wigs, attracted insects that would then become trapped in the sticky substance. Teeth could be pulled by any number of people. With no real dentists in colonial America, having a tooth that needed to be pulled meant a visit to the barber, surgeon, apothecary, or even the blacksmith, because there were no actual dentists. Prior to the need for such an intervention, people used figs, chamomile, booze, and opium as natural pain relievers to treat toothaches. While replacing a pulled tooth was normal, there was little concern for keeping teeth clean while they were still in the mouth. On occasion, the extracted teeth was merely reinserted into the socket. Dentures and prostheses were used more frequently. Alternatively, wood was shaped to fit, ivory and metal were used, or new teeth were extracted from impoverished people who were ready to sell their healthy chompers. George Washington, the most well-known colonial-era denture wearer, donned dentures made of metal, wire, and animal teeth, however, his mouthpiece continually hurt him and changed the shape of his face. All types of waste were disposed of in privy pots and outhouses. Near their cabin, colonial families had outhouses, more precisely, a covered hole in the ground. They could use the chamber pot inside when they couldn't or didn't go to the outhouse. Chamber pots had to be routinely emptied, but they were typically just thrown outside the window or close to the house. People frequently resided close water sources in rural areas. Human waste entered lakes, rivers, and streams, contaminating the water supply and disseminating disease. However, privy pots discovered in 2014 during excavations in urban areas like Philadelphia showed more than just common household and human waste. Glasses, bottles, bowls, and drinking tankards were discovered when excavators discovered a dozen brick-lined privy tunnels behind what had once been an illegal tavern. Additionally, there were wig curlers, tanning supplies, and locally produced pottery. The discovery, which dates from right around the Revolutionary War, provides the strongest indication of people drinking, talking politics, and arguing, according to archaeologist Rebecca Yamin. Early colonists only used one tool to clean their teeth and ears. In the 1990s, archaeologists found a silver ear picker at the site of Jamestown's initial fort. The early 17th century tool had a small scooping tool on one end and a pointed pick on the other. Ear picks were employed for a number of sanitary purposes, such as toothpicks, to clean under one's fingernails, and more. The ear spoon-shaped side may have been used to scrape off earwax, but it also served as an excellent tool for gathering the precious substance. To keep thread from unraveling, earwax was used instead of beeswax. Early colonies frequently had dysentery. Sadly, Colonists died from numerous epidemics of cholera, dysentery, typhoid, and smallpox because they rarely bathed and had no idea how diseases were spread. In colonial America, sickness spread because there was generally poor sanitation in both rural and more densely inhabited areas. In contrast to the possibility of streets being clogged with litter, refuse of all types, and animal waste, outhouses and privy pots were frequently located close to water sources and habitations. Dysentery, cholera, and typhoid fever were widespread illnesses that were especially common during the hot summer months. Many Boston children died in a bloody flux outbreak in 1676, and Nathaniel Bacon Jr., the leader of Bacon's Rebellion, unexpectedly passed away from the illness the same year. The waterborne sickness continued to spread and infected both soldiers and civilians. Nearly two-thirds of George Washington's 2,000-man army died of dysentery, typhoid, and influenza while they were tented at Valley Forge in December 1777. Military leaders were also aware of the risks associated with summer campaigns, yet illness outbreaks may have helped the colony succeed because many British soldiers in the South contracted various types of fevers.